Welcome everyone as we continue our journey through the season of Lent. Jerusalem is getting closer and the events of that Holy Week. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent and I want to thank you for taking time to worship God with me today. Let's begin as always with our responsive call to worship. This is based on the gospel lesson that we're going to hear a little later on from Luke's gospel about the prodigal son and also inspired by the second letter to the Corinthians chapter 5. Like a loving father, God offers us freedom to choose our own path. In God's freedom, we are a new creation. Like a merciful mother, God offers us compassion when we lose our way. In God's mercy, we are a new creation. Like a forgiving parent, God welcomes us home with open arms. In God's embrace, we are a new creation. Come. Let us worship the one who makes all things new. This week I light our Christ candle, remembering all those who find themselves homeless at this time, whether through the actions of others or for no particular reason, but who have no home to go to. May God be a light to them, showing them the way home. I'm now going to invite you to say with me our opening prayer, our prayer of approach. Let's say this together. Let us pray. Merciful God, you seek the lost sheep of your pasture, you call out to all who have strayed. As the father welcomed the prodigal son home, receive us back into your loving arms. Your steadfast love, O oh God, knows no bounds. Your loving embrace is always there for us. Be with us in our time of worship, that, that we may feel your presence and know that you are our true home. Amen. I now have a chance to share with you two pieces of good news, two birthdays this coming week. The first is tomorrow, and it is the one and only Pamela Werry. Pamela is, I don't know how old she's going to be, but it's her birthday tomorrow. That's Monday the 28th of March. Pamela is a pillar of our church, and thank you, Pamela, for all that you do, seen and unseen. It's also the birthday of someone who's been a good servant to our church in the past, and that's April Dawn Perrin. It's her birthday on April the 1st. I don't know what it's like having a birthday on April Fool's Day, but I'm sure you will have a good time, April, and that the family will make a good fuss of you and make sure you get to celebrate in style. So happy birthday to April Dawn and to Pamela. And so we're going to turn to the second letter to the church in Corinth and we're going to hear from the fifth chapter verses 16 to 21. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. 
we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now it's time for the Gospel as we hear that very well-known story, the parable of the prodigal son who took everything, lost everything, and then was given everything. Let's hear the story from Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. <laughs> Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's time for us to say those very familiar words that we all know as we say together the Lord's Prayer. 
Let's bow our heads and say it now. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We know that we need to wash our clothes on a regular basis, even if they don't necessarily look very dirty. We know that things build up and we wash them out. So it is with our souls. We don't necessarily feel like bad people, but we do know that we make mistakes. And so we come to God and ask him to cleanse our souls of the mistakes that we know of and those we do not. It's time for our prayer of confession. Let us say this prayer together. In your love, O God, we are never lost. In your care, O Christ, we are forever found. Help us feel this truth in our very bones, for we are often far from home, unsure of how to return. Teach our closed-up hearts to embrace your hope. Teach our shriveled souls to cry out to you. For we long to taste the glory of your heavenly banquet, and we yearn to be held in your arms as beloved children. Amen. Hold fast to these words of assurance. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. In Christ we are reconciled indeed, for we have found our true home. Amen. I'm very excited to share with you today our anthem. I've come across a group called Hymns of Grace who dedicate themselves to singing hymns and they do so beautifully. They sing old hymns that we might have forgotten about, they sing new hymns that we might not know yet, and they sing classic hymns. They cover the range. The number of singers varies each time I see them. Although there's one man who you'll see with a beard, Phil Webb, who seems to lead them and be present in everything that they do. Today they're going to sing for us an old hymn. It's a hymn by someone who really was a prodigal son, John Newton. We know how he was raised in a Christian home but walked away and became a slave trader. He's most famous, of course, for having written the hymn amazing grace. But he also wrote this challenging hymn that many people seem to have forgotten about. It's called, I Asked the Lord That I Might Grow. It's normally sung to the tune that we use for When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, but hymns of grace have married the words very beautifully with the old English tune, O Whaley Whaley. So let's hear them as they sing. I ask the Lord that I might grow. And if you like this, I hope you do, because we'll be hearing more of them over the next couple of months. In fact, you'll be hearing them again singing our postlude at the end. Let's hear Hymns of Grace. I am 
ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. Twas he who taught me thus to pray, and he I trust has answered prayer. Last week's message was all about repentance, and repentance is certainly part of this week's story as well. Some people even think that the phrase prodigal son means 
the repentant son, because the headline event, after all, is the son admitting his mistake and returning to the father. So they think prodigal means repenting and going back to the father. But prodigal actually reflects the mistakes the young man made in life, not his repentance. Prodigal means wasteful, extravagant living. But this parable covers a lot more than just repentance. It highlights so much else too, from jealousy to forgiveness, from self-loathing to limitless love. When I spoke about repentance last week, I talked about leaving Cartwright, a place that there was only one road into and out of. Cartwright, Newfoundland and Labrador is a place you have to consciously choose to go to and when you are there, there's just one direction you can go in when you want to leave. But life isn't often like that really, is it? It's more complicated than that. We don't have a simple choice of just one direction in which we can go. Most of us, I'm sure, can look back on life and see plenty of places where we had multiple options and had to choose one. Sometimes we wonder what would have happened if we'd chosen a different route. The news is full of stories where people have made bad choices from the options presented to them. From Vladimir Putin to the 11 year old boy who took the 150 kilometers an hour joyride in Whitby this week. I want to share with you one man's story and the mistake that he made, which wasn't actually quite as serious as those I've just mentioned, but which did change his life, at least for a while. His name was Irvin Kreutz. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He was a worker in a German brewery who was never married and lived a quiet and rather lonely life in southern Germany. The only time he'd left his native country was on a day trip across the mountains into neighboring Switzerland, but he got back the same day. In 1977, however, he saw an ad for a trip to San Francisco in California. It was somewhere he had always wanted to go because he'd seen it on TV. He was also looking for a way to celebrate his upcoming 50th birthday. And so he booked a ticket and got on that flight. When the plane stopped to refuel and to clear US customs in Bangor, Maine, Irvin was half asleep, and when the flight attendant, who was herself disembarking at the end of her shift, said to him that she wished he had a happy vacation in San Francisco, Irvin, who didn't speak English, misunderstood. The only words he recognized were San Francisco, and he thought he was being told that he had arrived. So he got off the plane. San Francisco didn't really look like he had been expecting, but he put it down to the difference between real life and the magic of TV. Can you believe it took him four days to find out he wasn't in California after all? Four days. It was only when he got into a taxi and asked the driver to take him to downtown San Francisco, and he was told that he couldn't possibly afford that fare, that the truth began to dawn on him. Some owners of a local German restaurant were brought in to act as translators, and it was only then did he fully understand what had happened. But that wasn't the end of the story. He made the news, locally at first, but then the national news, 
and then the international news word even reached back to his native Germany. He became a celebrity in Bangor, Maine. Some First Nations people made him an honorary member of their tribe. He was given the keys to the city of Bangor. He was introduced to the state governor and the state's most famous seal, Andre. He was presented with an acre of land in northern Maine by a very generous couple. For weeks he was famous. He even received three proposals of marriage. Bangor threw a big party for him on the occasion of his 50th birthday. It was in the place of his choice, McDonald's, where he was allowed to fulfill his dream of flipping his own burgers. Now San Francisco wasn't about to miss out on the celebrations either. When they heard about Irvin's mistake, a San Francisco newspaper flew him over there and made a celebrity out of him there as well. They took him to the city of San Francisco and presented him with a key to add to the one from Bangor, Maine. For a while he lived the sort of life that could be compared to that of the prodigal son, but without the prostitutes as far as I know. He was fated wherever he went although he made it quite clear in California that actually he decided he would preferred Bangor, Maine to San Francisco. Also like the prodigal son, Irvin eventually returned home, where his story had also become big news. He went back to his job at the brewery, a little more famous than when he had left. But in the end, his fame cost him. It emerged that for various practical reasons, when he was at home, he drank a different brand of beer made by a rival brewer. Now, his employer couldn't have his most famous employee supporting a competitor, so he fired him. He lost his job. Unlike the prodigal son, there was no happy homecoming for Irvin Kreutz. He went back to the lonely life he had before. He ended his days in a nursing home suffering from dementia, brought on by excessive alcohol consumption, with his only companion, a weathered old photograph album of pictures taken on his trip to America. He died in 2010 at the age of 83. That is the kind of sad ending that should have befallen the prodigal son. For a while he was famous, very famous. His money bought him celebrity and popularity. But of course it didn't last. It went as quickly as it had come and as shamefully. Like Irvin, he found himself now alone and abandoned. But when he returned home, his reception, of course, was quite different. The main difference being that there was someone there waiting for him, someone who loved him. Whereas Irvin returned to the same empty house he had left. The prodigal son's father saw him coming while he was still a long way off. I could be wrong, but to me that suggests that the father was actively looking for him. He missed his son and was hoping he would come back. That's certainly, I think, what Jesus was trying to express. When we make mistakes and go off on our own, choose our own path, avoid the narrow way that God sets, God is always looking for us and hoping we will come back. 
there will always be a hug waiting when you go back to God, however deeply you've gone into the darkness. Because God instinctively values you as a parent values a child. There is a story about a little five-year-old boy whose class at school made pottery objects to give to their parents at Christmas. I say object because anyone who has seen a five-year-old's crafts know that they are usually not very recognisable as what they're meant to be. So that the first question is very often, that's very nice, what is it? But this little boy was really proud of his creation and was looking forward to giving it to his mum and dad. But when his parents came to collect him from school on the last day of the semester, and as he picked up all his things, his pottery, wrapped in typical five-year-old style, slipped from his fingers and hit the floor with a sickening, crunching sound. The little boy burst into tears. His father hugged him and tried to console him, telling him it didn't matter. It was the thought that counts. But that didn't really help to stop the flow of tears. So his mum had a go. She picked him up and she cuddled him. And when he finally stopped crying over the fate of his special present, she said to him, come on, let's pick up the pieces and see what we can make out of what is left. God is waiting for you to come home. There you will receive a welcome that says, let's pick up the pieces of your life and see what we can make out of what is left. I didn't tell you everything about Irvin Kreutz. When he found himself no longer famous and when he was out of work and living alone, very much like the prodigal son, he tried also to put his life back together. He made another trip to Bangor, Maine, deliberately this time, to see if he could resurrect himself there. He hoped his fame there would give him a chance to start again, would give him a head start to find a better way of life. But having used up most of his savings to fly back there, the only offer of work that he got was as a minimum wage janitor at a shopping mall that he had previously helped to open. He appreciated the offer, but it wasn't what he was hoping for, and he went back to Germany for the rest of his days. The offer waiting for us from God is much better than we could even hope for. God wants to put a ring on our finger and put a robe around our shoulders. God wants to throw a big party to celebrate our return. For the father lost a child who went away broken into pieces by the ways of the world. But the father got back a son who was made whole, who now understood that what is really important in life cannot be bought. You cannot buy the love of God. It is freely given to those who return home. Amen.
The prodigal son eventually found his way home and found a welcome that he neither expected or felt he deserved. We know that God reserves such a welcome for us too. May we also find our way home. Let's reflect that idea in our prayers of the people. Let us pray. Loving God, May we be found by you when we wander away lost, and may we find a place called home, a place where faith holds us and grace renews us, where forgiveness longs for us to be who you made us to be. May we find a place called home where we are accepted as we are, where we are taken in and loved unconditionally, like the prodigal son was received by his father. May we find a place called home where we belong and our souls fit and our difficult questions are allowed to be asked and our anger is heard and our needs are recognised, where our pain is felt by you and our names are known to you. May this church be that place, O oh God, this community, this spread out group of travellers and doubters and companions on the way. May this home be where your place is. May it be our place and your place. And may this place not be a building, but a new way of being together in a relationship held together by love, even when separated by miles. Loving God, welcoming God, may we make this a home to all who still seek a place of grace-filled sanctuary. For those who still seek a gracious welcome that they feel they neither deserve nor expect. Creator, we know there is endless space left in this home for those who are also seeking its comforts. Be with them as they search for you and enable them to quieten their souls, to listen for your still small voice, speaking personally to them, calling to them, blessing them. Hear us now as we raise up to you those we are aware of that need your help today, hear us as we pray. As you love us with endless grace, we raise these things confident that you are listening to our heartfelt prayers. And we say thank you, O God. Amen. I want to send you on your way with a blessing. Just as God's word was sent to the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into this world today to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world and may the grace and peace of God, the Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Oh
the peace of God our Heavenly Father and the grace of Christ the risen Son and the fellowship of God the Spirit keep our hearts and minds within His love and to Him be praise for His glorious reign from the depths of earth to the heights of heaven we declare the name of the Lamb once slain Christ eternal the King of kings May this peace which passes understanding and this grace which makes us what we are and this fellowship of his communion make us one in spirit and in heart and to him be praise for his glorious reign from the depths of earth to the heights of heaven, we declare the name of the Lamb once slain, Christ eternal, the King of kings.